Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. All right, guys. Fourth video of the day. I feel like I've hit my stride. If you're new to the channel, hello, my name is Connor. I live in Rhode Island, the best state in the union. New England. Uh, and I like to learn about history uh, through YouTube recommendations. The original link to the video, top of the description below, like always. Make sure to check. I'm going to give them a preeminent like just because they're a great channel and I know it's going to be a good video. Yeah, this is the same channel that the Gustavus Adolphus video uh, was on. So yeah, love for you to join uh, the, so the original link will be at the top of the description, Discord right below that. Just click on it, send you right over there. Hit that green check when you get over there. Um, and uh, yeah, love to have you. More the merrier. Pull up a chair, my friend. Hope you all are doing well. Let's go. The uh, staggering siege of Vienna, 1683. So I've been trying to do better, uh, get more into a schedule. My, uh, the marshals over on Discord really helped me out with that, although I can, I'm sure I can be pretty frustrating. And, uh, yeah, so I've done uh, two of the series, two of the episodes in the series I've been doing on um, Hannibal. Then I did an episode of the Northern War series, two more episodes of that. And uh, so now I'm doing this, one of the recommended. Let's go. If you're not ready to... That was intense. On the 14th. Sorry, this is a great channel. If you're not ready to learn, there's the door. Get out. Home X down the hall. Make me some spaghetti. You're in the wrong class. Of July. I love that. On the 14th of July, 1683, an Ottoman army under the command of Grand Vizier Kara Mustafa Pasha arrived at the gates of Vienna. Their arrival marked the beginning of a siege, characterized by subterranean warfare, delayed reinforcements, and an apocalyptic storm of Tatar raiders ravaging the hinterland. The siege was eventually ended by the Battle of Vienna, when the winged hussars arrived under King Jan III Sobieski and famously charged into the Ottoman army. The siege and Battle of Vienna are discussed extensively by historians up to this day. It is considered the turning point in the westward expansion of the Ottomans, and it is an interesting case study for any student of warfare. This is how contemporary historiography tells the story of the staggering siege of Vienna. Oh, great maps. Great maps. I'm a simpleton. I like picture books, all right? A threat from the east. So they actually wore those wings when the Ottoman Grand Vizier Ahmed Köprülü died in 1676, there had been 12 years of peace between the Ottomans and the Austrians. After two years of conflict, the Austro-Turkish War had ended with the Peace Treaty of Vasvar in 1666. Uh. Conflict. There had been 12 years of peace between the Ottomans and the Austrians. After two years of conflict, the Austro-Turkish War had ended with the Peace Treaty of Vasvar in 1664. Köprülü had been satisfied with the benefits of the treaty. But after his death, the fanatically anti-Austrian Kara Mustafa Pasha succeeded him as Grand Vizier. In 1682, the peace treaty should have been extended, but the negotiations failed. Further to the west, the other great rival of the Habsburgs at the time, France, noticed the change of mood. They hastened to encourage the Ottoman aspirations. Pressure was adding up on Austria, that since 1678 already had to deal with an open rebellion of the Protestant nobility of Hungary, whom the Catholic Habsburgs had been suppressing. The leader of the revolt, Emerik Tökeli, quickly gained control over the highlands of Upper Hungary. The Ottomans certainly appreciated this development. In 1682, the Ottoman-Hungarian friendship ripened into a full alliance. It soon became obvious that the Ottomans were preparing another war against Austria. It was no surprise when on the 2nd of January 1683, they declared war on the Habsburgs. Although they had been preparing for this war for a while, they were very slow to make their appearance at the border region, as the historian and siege expert Christopher Duffy explains. Given the warning now, this is my first time learning about the Ottomans I've been wanting to do for a while. Sorry if I backtrack. Appearance at the border region, as the historian and siege expert Christopher Duffy explains. It took the Ottoman army until the beginning of summer, when they had completed their march and were ready to invade Habsburg lands. This gave the defenders the time to prepare themselves and reach out for help. 
After lengthy negotiations and a series of intrigues, the Polish King Jan Sobieski, who had previously considered an alliance with the French, signed a defensive agreement with the Holy Roman Empire on the 31st of March 1683. When the Ottoman army reached Belgrade, Sultan Mehmed IV named Kara Mustafa Seraskar, that is, commander of the army. Then, the Sultan exchanged the armor of the warrior for hunting clothes and left the army. According to the historian Klaus Peter Maczke, it was only when the Ottomans reached Stuhl Weissenburg on the 25th of June that Kara Mustafa announced his further plans. To the great consternations of his commanders, he intended to push straight on to Vienna instead of reducing the frontier strongholds. Not only did this take the Ottoman leaders by surprise, but also the defenders of the empire. The commander of their field army, Duke Charles V of Lorraine, had only about 33,000 men at his disposal. At first, he tried to distract the Ottomans by besieging the fortress of Neuhäusel. This failed and cost him valuable time. He then hurried to Raab which had been built up as the main means of the Austrian line of defense by the experienced chief engineer of the empire, Georg Rimpler. Despite all preparations, however, the Tatars swam the river Raab 10 engineers. miles above the city. Sorry if you can hear any uh, construction noises in the background, guys. Despite all preparations, however, the Tatars swam the river Raab 10 miles above the city on the 1st of July, and Charles, fearing to be outflanked, left only a small garrison in the city. He himself fell back in the direction of Vienna. Near the town of Petronel, the quickly moving Tatars encountered the rearguard of Charles' army. After some initial confusion in the rows of the rearguard, the Tatars were pushed back and routed. However, for the next months, they plundered and ravaged the land around Vienna. This apocalyptic storm, as the historian Ekehard Eikhoff calls it, left villages and monasteries in burning ruins, while many of their inhabitants were raped, abducted and killed. Meanwhile, according to Christopher Duffy, Kara Mustafa was still in Rab and beset by doubts. He sent a messenger to Sultan Mehmed IV, asking for his retrospective approval to attack Vienna. The seven-day delay resulting from this request was vital for the Viennese, who had only fully understood their situation after the encounter at Petronel. After seven days, Kara Mustafa left 12,000 men to blockade Rab and march towards Vienna without having received an answer from the Sultan. Meanwhile, Emperor Leopold I organized the defenses of the city, appointed Count Ernst Rüdiger von Starenberg, commander of the garrison, and then left the city on the 7th of July. About 80,000 citizens followed him. 1683 was not the first time an Ottoman army stood at the gates of Vienna. One and a half centuries earlier, in 1529, a Turkish army had already tested the defenses of the city. Now, before the Second Ottoman siege, it was the task of the famous engineer Georg Rimpler to prepare the already formidable defenses of the city for the upcoming battle. I love how engineers are According getting to the love. historian Andrew Wheatcroft, Rimpler understood the Turkish style of siege warfare from his experience at Kandia. There, he was present when the Ottomans besieged the city for a total of 21 years. He knew that the main threat would be posed by the Turkish miners. He correctly assumed it would be almost impossible to approach the city from the north and east because of the rivers Danube and Wien. So, Rimpler focused his resources on the southwestern and southern side of the city. Vienna was designed as a bastion fort, which meant it was built with thick and relatively low walls of earth and stone, intended to withstand artillery fire for a long time. Moreover, the bastions and their corresponding outworks were aligned in a way that they could cover all areas of attack with musket and artillery fire. Rimpler ordered to cut embrasures in the parapets of the existing defenses, to create protected artillery positions and wherever there was enough space, had his soldiers, supported by the people of Vienna, build strong retrenchments and palisades on the bastions and ravelines. On the far side of the ditch, the Viennese also strengthened the covered way by adding additional strong points and palisaded traverses. These were additional small walls on the covered way. They were built to reduce damage by enemy artillery fire prevent enfilades and contain attackers in case the outer defenses would be breached. In the ditch itself, a lower rampart, in military jargon a fausse bre, was built and a network of covered passageways, called caponiers, was run from the ravelings to the shoulder angles of the adjacent bastions. 
They covered the ditch with fire from a secured position. Young and Old worked frantically on the defenses, until the last possible minute. Food and powder were still brought into the city during the last moments, together with masses of people from the hinterland, seeking refuge behind the walls. Rimpler made Vienna a towering stronghold of steel, stone and earth. Seems pretty good at his job. On the 14th of July, finally, Kara Mustafa and his men arrived at the gates of Vienna. The size of his army... Charles V left the city with, with the field army. It was vital to maintain a mobile force for strategic purposes. He is still subject to debate. Ekehard Eikhoff reckons... Wait, what is... The July, finally, what? Kara Mustafa and his men arrived at the gates of Vienna. The size of his army is still subject to debate. Ekehard Eikhoff reckons he brought about 150,000 men, but numbers given by modern scholars range from 110,000 to 200,000. About 20,000 of them were Janissaries, the elite infantry of the Ottoman army. Kara Mustafa and his vast force faced a garrison that was relatively small for a city of the size of Vienna. The commander of the defense, Ernst Rüdiger von Starenberg, had only about 10,000 regular soldiers and an unexperienced urban militia at his disposal. All in all, this was about a tenth of the Ottoman force. On the day the Ottomans arrived, a messenger informed the Polish King Jan Sobieski about the dire situation of the town. Immediately, Sobieski began to master the Polish army. Sorry, my hat is just being itchy. He planned to march immediately, Sobieski began to master the Polish army. He planned to march before the end of July and to reach the gates of Vienna with 50,000 men on the 20th of August. The Ottomans made camp west of Vienna. On the 15th of July, the Grand Vizier sent an envoy to the city, demanding from the Viennese to capitulate, to convert to Islam and to pay tribute to the Ottoman Empire. Starenberg refused, and the Ottoman guns opened fire. The Ottomans had significantly less artillery at hand than the defenders of the city, which was highly unusual for a siege. Moreover, according to Christopher Duffy, their guns were mostly of medium caliber, and they didn't have any heavy pieces at all. This meant that breaching walls as thick as those of Vienna from afar was even more difficult than with heavy guns. Like in any other European siege of that time, the Ottomans had to dig extensive networks of ditches and trenches to slowly approach the walls and in Sorry, is anyone who has been to Austria or been to uh, Vienna uh, is it really this flat? You know, is it in this big valley in, in the mountains or plain plateau? The Germans had to dig extensive networks of ditches and trenches to slowly approach the walls and install artillery positions close enough to breach the wall. Much to the Ottomans' delight, they could open their trenches very close to the walls, covered safely by the ruins of the Viennese suburbs outside the walls. They had been burned by the defenders, but they were not fully destroyed. By the 16th of July, Vienna was completely surrounded. To answer the encirclement, the isolated Viennese garrison had to come up with some way of communicating with the field army, their allies and the emperor. The solution was a group of brave messengers, who either swam the Danube at night, or somehow sneaked through the enemy lines. These messengers maintained a trickling flow of communication. However, not all of these stealth missions were successful. Some of the messengers were caught by the Ottomans and in Why not dress obviously when if you talk you're not you're probably going to be given away because of your accent, but why not sort of dress like an Ottoman? I, maybe that's not feasible. So these messengers maintained a trickling flow of communication. However, not all of these stealth missions were successful. Some of the messengers were caught by the Ottomans and interrogated. This was the case with one envoy heading for the camp of the field army on the 18th of July. He was tortured until he told Kara Mustafa the numbers of the defenders. Starting in the suburbs, the Ottoman drove forward three groups of trenches against the Leuvel Bastion, the Burg Raveline and the Burg Bastion. The Ottoman trenches wormed forward quickly, and in the night of the 22nd to the 23rd of July, the first battery was established and opened fire. In a parallel to the earthwork on the surface, tunnels were dug by the Ottoman miners. And on the 24th, 
The first two mines exploded on the far side of the ditch, opposite the Löbel and Burg Bastion. Subsequently, the Viennese positioned a man in every basement to listen for digging and tapping noises, to detect future mine attacks early. They now also began to dig mine tunnels themselves, but they had fewer and less experienced miners. Sorry, what if they ran, like, what if they connected to each other by accident? On the 25th of July, Ottoman miners damaged the palisade opposite the Löwel and Burg Bastion. And during a successful counterattack against one of these breaches, Rimpler's arm was shattered. He was taken back to the city, where he died on the 3rd of August. Vienna had lost its best engineer. I'm glad he gave us, you know, some shout outs to the engineer. The Viennese continued to undermine the Ottoman trenches. Their first mine under the field fortifications of the Ottomans exploded on the 26th of July, but didn't cause much damage. On the following days, the Ottoman miners were much more successful. They repeatedly collapsed parts of the palisades on the covered way. On the 30th of July, one explosion near the Burg Bastion was followed by an assault of the Janissaries. Wait, this... I, have an, I have a question. I, I've been pausing a ton this video. So was that actually the point of the Viennese? Is that right, Viennese? You know, the Viennan um, people who were digging the tunnels. Was the point to kind of go through to the Ottomans and then blow up something? Or was the point to, you know, reach... And break through to a, a tunnel that the Ottomans were making so they know you know knew where it was and could send soldiers down or, or maybe cause a, a a collapse or some sort. One explosion near the Burg Bastion was followed by an assault of the Janissaries. This the Viennese couldn't stop. They were forced to abandon their trenches and to pull back to the covered way. The Ottomans now reached the palisades in front of the Ravelin and installed a battery of 30 guns before the Louisville Bastion. In almost no time, the Ottomans destroyed the elevated artillery platform of the Bastion, the Cavalier. The Viennese couldn't do anything about it and had to confine themselves to recover their artillery from the chaos and to cut embrasures into the remnants of this defensive structure. In the meantime, the Emperor had arrived in Passau from where he relentlessly organized support to relieve the city. That's a beautiful this was an expensive thing. undertaking. Most of the finances were supplied by Pope Innocent XI, who wanted to prevent any further Muslim expansion in Europe by all means necessary. An additional budget was granted by the Imperial Diet. First, reinforcements from Bavaria appeared on the 23rd of July. Further reinforcements were on the march, and Leopold I was informed that Sobieski was gathering his men. The field army under Charles of Lorraine had taken position in Jedlesi, north of Vienna, and was constantly skirmishing with the Tatars and trying to secure strategically important locations. However, he couldn't hinder the Ottomans to take several cities and strongholds in the surrounding area of Vienna. In the meantime, in the Ottoman camp, Kara Mustafa came under pressure when he finally received an answer from Sultan Mehmed. The Sultan was bewildered that the Grand Vizier attacked Vienna instead of supporting the Hungarian uprising and conquering strongholds along the border. Meanwhile, tension in the city rose as well. On the 27th of July, the Viking important. the Hungarian the Sultan pressure. In the meantime, in the Ottoman camp, Kara Mustafa came under pressure when he finally received an answer from Sultan Mehmed. The Sultan was bewildered that the Grand Vizier attacked Vienna instead of supporting the Hungarian uprising and conquering strongholds along the border. I'm glad I rewinded. Meanwhile, tension in the city rose as well. On the 27th of July, the Viennese mobilized all able-bodied men not already serving and began to fix prices for fundamental goods such as food and medication. Additionally, the bodies heaping up within the city were becoming a problem. Orders on how to dispose of them were issued. On the other side of the walls, supplies ran low as well. Nobody had expected the siege to last that long. And at the end of the month, all provisions in the Ottoman camp had been eaten up. Additional supplies had to be brought from the remote oven, today Budapest, because the Tatars had destroyed much of the surroundings during their raids. Although it became increasingly more difficult for messengers to get through the Ottoman lines, from time to time a brave soul made it. 
The risk repelled most from even trying, and those who did demanded an extraordinary reward of up to 200 ducats, which equals approximately 100,000 to 150,000 dollars. Probably the most famous among these mass senders was the Polish nobleman Czerci Franciszek Kulczyki, who sneaked out of the city disguised as a Turk and came back on the 17th of August to inform the battered Viennese that a relief army of nearly 70,000 men was gathering near the city. Legend has it that he used his reward to open the first cafe in Vienna, using coffee beans left behind by the Ottomans. However, nowadays most scholars regard this as a myth. In the meantime, the Ottoman pressure on the covered way increased from day to day, until on the 3rd of August they conquered a long stretch of it. The defenders had no choice but to abandon the palisades before the reveling. Continuing their advance, the Ottomans built descents into the ditch. This heralded the second stage of the siege, the battle for the ditch. Oh, great channel. The Ottomans entered the ditch through two tunnels opposite the bastions and began to work their way towards the ravelin. While the Ottomans advanced their saps and mines, the defenders could now utilize Rimpler's low-lying caponiers. From the safety of these defenses, they maintained a deadly fire, and by using loose earth from an exploded mine, they built a small number of redoubts. Even though the Viennese earth from an exploded mine, they built a small number of redoubts. Even though the Viennese destroyed the tunnel closest to the Burg Bastion and buried 30 Ottomans alive, the besiegers came closer. In a storm assault on the 8th of August, the first Janissaries reached the city wall, but were ultimately repelled. In the next few days, Ottoman mines exploded under the bastions and the Ravelin, causing a breach in the latter, which the Viennese spared only in the last possible moment. Guys, when were the first mines used? Then, they launched a number of sorties to destroy the tunnels of the attackers. They all failed and many valuable men were lost. The Ottoman pressure on the city lasted. While the fight in the trenches was raging on, the bloody flux broke out in the city. This is an infectious disease that results in diarrhea with blood. It decimated the town's population across all social groups. Count of Starnberg II fell sick on the 11th of August. He survived, but it took almost 10 days until he recovered enough to take up command again. Why are they By then, blood? he had to conscript all men who had not yet been working on the defenses or fighting. Even those who weren't able-bodied. Those who refused were threatened to face the death penalty. But I'm 87 and I have no eye and I can barely walk. Sorry, we need you. Or you die. The Ottomans, meanwhile, made yeah, further progress, despite three of their own mines being destroyed by the Viennese countermines and artillery. They had advanced to the center of the ditch by the 15th of August. The Viennese immediately launched a sortie to counter the Ottoman progress. This time round, they succeeded and dealt the attackers a severe blow. Storming forward from their positions, they killed many Ottomans in the ditch, then destroyed their earthwork, burned support beams and finally destroyed all the mines they found. For the Ottomans, this was a severe setback. It took them 12 days. I love how they're just like... ...to regain full control. For the Ottomans, this was a severe setback. It took them 12 days to regain full control over the lost positions. For the next two weeks, no side made any notable progress, although they had a number of bloody fights. More Ottoman mines exploded and their soldiers charged the positions of the defenders repeatedly. These in turn tried to throw the attackers back further by launching additional sorties. Both parties won little but suffered heavy losses. Overall, the Viennese, who were fewer in numbers, suffered more from this than the large Ottoman army. Later on, in the last week of August, when heavy rainfall turned the siege into a mud fight, Starnberg mobilized all resources. Such a good he channel. ordered his men to construct a second line of defense behind the city walls, spanning from the Burg Bastion to the Löwel Bastion. More and more, the commander feared for the city walls. So did they have to demolish a bunch of houses? Bastion. More and more, the commander feared for the city walls. While the defenders of Vienna were struggling to hold up against the ongoing assaults, 
The Emperor had no choice but to wait for more reinforcements, as they were arriving slowly, little by little. Charles V of Lorraine and his army left Jedlesee on the 24th of August and marched towards the agreed venue at Tulln. However, the most important reinforcements were late. King Jan Sobieski left Krakow only on the 14th of August, two weeks later than he had promised. Remember in September. Can I ask something? Why do all of every single Habsburg king or every single Habsburg king or royal or whatnot that I see from whether it be from front from you know Spain, Austria, or wherever, always has this huge chin? I mean, it's just an On the first of September, a messenger made it to the city and brought news that the relief army would soon arrive. He was immediately sent back to the Emperor with a desperate appeal for help. The defenders couldn't take it any longer. The toll of the ongoing bombardment of the city was high. In early September, food ran out as well. While the Ottomans could at least forage small amounts of food, hunger became a real problem within the city. Only short-lived relief came when two successful sorties from the Schottentor brought back 22 oxen and two horses. The Schottentor... The Schottentor is named after a monastery founded in the 12th century. Successful sorties from the Schottentor brought back 22 oxen and two horses. This was no long time solution for the large Viennese population, but it alleviated the problem for the moment. To signal the dire situation to the approaching relief army, every I night the man. Viennese launched rockets from the St. Stephen's Cathedral. While the situation was becoming more and more dire, Starnberg pushed everyone hard to finish the second line of defense in the streets behind the threatened section of the wall. They dug redoubts, walkways, built palisades and parapets, feverishly and desperately. On the other side of the wall, the Ottomans continued their approach. The defenders again made multiple sorties to destroy more Ottoman mining tunnels, but they mostly failed. Eventually, Starnberg ordered his men to abandon the rest of the Raveline, the Counterscarp and the Kapaneers. By the night of the 2nd to the 3rd of September, the Ottoman trenches virtually embraced the Raveline. Their mine tunnels reached 2 or 3 meters under the city walls. Now everything came down to the defenses of the curtain wall, that is the piece of wall between the two bastions. While the Ottomans reinforced their seps by covering them with a roofing of planks, tree trunks and sandbags, the Austrians relentlessly pelted them with earthenware hand grenades. Enemy miners now frequently encountered each other in their tunnels. The tunnels had grown so dense that they virtually formed a subterranean network. When miners of the two sides encountered each other, about either flaps? by coincidence or intentionally because they wanted to destroy the other's mines or tunnels, bloody and brutal struggles ensued. With melee weapons crammed together in the muddy dark tunnels. How many people died of, of cave-ins? There had to have been a lot. Where they could often barely stand upright, the men blindly fought for their lives. The commander of the relief army, Charles of Lorraine, and Jan Sobieski met at Oberhollerbrunn, far ahead of their armies on the 31st of August, to hold a council of war. According to Ekehard Eikhoff, it was somewhat surprising how well the two got along, considering that they had both competed for the throne of Poland twice in the past. However, Charles V left the overall command to the Polish king without quarrels. Five days later, their two armies and troops of Bavaria, Saxony and various other German states joined near Tulln. According to Christopher Duffy, this force numbered about 68,000 men in total. In early September, the first mine detonated under the curtain wall. Although it was very effective, loose parts of the wall fell towards the ditch and slowed down the Ottoman assault following the blast. This gave the townspeople enough time to bar the gap with strong palisades. Shortly after, another explosion tore down a large segment of the Burg Bastion. Janissaries were sighted on top of the bastion. However, the ascent was too... Why not have a second mine explosion, you know, bomb ready for when the cave-in causes another sort of wall and then... It was steep for a full-scale assault. After two hours, the Janissaries had no choice but to give in to the steady fire of the defenders and to pull back. 
The breach was fixed with sandbags and chevaux de frise, that is, portable barriers of spikes, and fully enclosed under the cover of night. At that time, the strain of continuous battle was heavily wearing down both belligerents. The Ottoman troops were disaffected with Kara Mustafa because he dulled out their pay. The Tatar leaders were offended by the way he treated them too. According to Christopher Duffy, the Janissaries were especially discontented because the siege had been going on for longer than the customary 40 days, and because they feared the Grand Vizier could negotiate terms with the city, which would deprive them of their right to plunder. Although the mood in the Ottoman camp was running low, they again tried on the next day. After detonating two more mines at the outer end of the Louisville Bastion. So is that a common thing for mercenaries? Sort of, you know, if we do breach the city, like your payment is you get to loot what you want. They launched another assault and were repelled again. Within the city, no more than 4,000 able-bodied men were left to defend Vienna. On top of that, the artillerymen refused to take their positions like unless they got a massive pay raise. And the citizens would only set to work when threatened with death. As time was passing, the relief army came ever closer. Pressure rose on Kara Mustafa, who wanted to take the city before it arrived. When a Viennese envoy who betrayed his city informed Mustafa that a relief army was very close, he fully realized how pressing his situation was. The Grand Vizier prepared for the clash. On the 7th, oh. army came ever closer. Pressure rose on Kara Mustafa, who wanted to take the city before it arrived. When a Viennese envoy who betrayed his city informed... So this old man, who's like kept for, uh, forcing a fight on her death, is like, screw it, I'm just gonna go over there and tell him. Mustafa, that a relief army was very close, he fully realized how pressing his situation was. The Grand Vizier prepared for the clash. On the 7th of December, he had no choice but to redeploy his troops to face the relief attack. He held a council of war on the upcoming battle and scouted the possible approaches for Sobieski and Charles of Lorraine. In the meantime, the Ottomans conquered the Fours Bre on the next day and prepared five huge mines under the city walls. The charges were placed and the fuses ready to light when the relief army came into sight on the height of the Kallenberg. Like Gandalf coming over. This reminds me of the Battle of Helm's Deep when they're all bringing the mines under to breach the wall and then Gandalf finally arrives with the cavalry. The relief army crossed the Danube not too far from Vienna. At the recommendation of Charles V, who had convinced the Polish king of his battle plan, the relief army left its baggage train and marched through the Vienna woods. The way through this almost impassable terrain was arduous and slow. Only very few artillery pieces Especially could be brought the along. No I hope they took down the wings uh, to, you know, while they're traveling through the, the thick forest. Ice could reach the men so that they had to march without provisions for two days. However, there were no other difficulties because there were no Ottoman fortifications on the Kallenberg. On the 11th of September, the Viennese allies arrived at the top of the mountain and went to sleep, already arranged in battle order. In this tense moment, Charles of Lorraine received a short note written by Starnberg. It said, quote, There is no time to lose, my lord. No time to lose at all. Kara Mustafa oh left 10,000 to 15,000 men in the trenches and ordered the rest to deploy for battle at the foot of the hill. When the sun rose above Vienna, the Allied troops marched down the hill, still holding battle order. The left flank consisted of the Imperial Army under the command of Charles of Lorraine. The center of the troops from Saxony, Bavaria, Franconia, Swabia and other German states. The Polish under the command of their king formed the right flank. They faced roughly 80,000 soldiers who were drawn up in a similar matter. Kara Mustafa and the Ottomans in the center, the Moldavian and Wallachian vessels on the right, and the Tatars on the left flank. When slowly advancing down the hill in full battle order, the left wing of the relief army made contact first. In a fierce struggle, they drove back the detachment of Janissaries at Nussdorf. In a steady advance, the relief army pushed forward, forcing the Ottomans back. 
After six hours of constant advance, during which most of the fighting happened on the left flank, Charles V and his men stood before the Ottoman camp. Then they halted to let the Polish catch up on the right flank, where they had to cover the longest distance. Now, Sobieski, who had been waiting on the Kahlenberg to observe the events, joined his troops. For a moment, the armies paused in suspense. I love the rook with wings symbol. Suddenly, the men on the left flank stormed forward before Charles V had a chance to order the attack. The center of the army almost immediately joined the assault. On the right flank, Jan Sobieski and his winged hussars set their horses in motion. On the slightly declining ground, they built up their momentum, charged down the hill and swept through the weakened and disordered Ottoman army. Seeing this, the defenders of Vienna gathered their last strength I really want and to launched know a final sortie to the Ottoman trenches. How many die from Before trample? sunset, the fight was decided. Versus spear. The Ottoman army turned to flight. Kara Mustafa himself fled as well after his eye had gotten injured. Vienna was saved. After the battle, the Polish turned to looting the camp of the defeated, where they found enormous treasures. Meanwhile, the rest of the army had to stay in battle order because Charles V of Lorraine didn't fully believe in the victory yet. Nobody thought of pursuing the Ottoman. They brought a bunch of treasures over there? How could there have been a bunch of treasures from the... As the defenders reviewed the damage at the walls, they found the five mines ready to explode and realized that they had been at the verge of losing their wall. On the next day, the emperor hurried to the city, participated in the victory mass in the St. Stephen's Cathedral. Only on the 18th of September did Polish and Imperial troops set out to pursue the fleeing Ottomans. I don't think the Sultan is going to be happy. Kara Mustafa searched for a scapegoat and executed the governor of Oven, claiming that he was the first to flee. However, Sultan Mehmed was well aware of the truth. On the 25th of December, when the Grand Vizier arrived in Belgrade, Emissaries of the Sultan delivered him a death warrant and then strangled him with a silk string. Awesome video, awesome channel. Keep them to my schedule. Promise you guys on the uh, British County videos yesterday that if I got 20 likes and it has over 200 likes, I should have risen that. That I would uh, learn and memorize all of the counties in, in uh, England and I'll post a quiz of it. I'm doing pretty well. I did a good amount last night, and I'll finish that up. See you guys next time. Hope you're doing well. Follow my TikTok.